Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be setting up a damage overlay as well as a health system for the player and some basic enemy AI to make them attack the player and a little bit of repositioning code to make them reposition. Now there was one thing I needed to fix with the cultist dissolve effect before we get started on that and then there's also a couple issues later on with making the material on the post processing effect actually reset after a scene reload due to death. The effect we're going to be going with is actually a post processing effect and it's going to be fading between just kind of a desaturation vignette so it'll be desaturating the edges of the camera to a red pulsing effect to a black pulsing effect to death so that, that way we've got a full range of transition at, based off of how damaged the player is and we're just going to be basing it off of the idea that the player can take three hits before they die and that's it so let's go ahead and dive in there we're going to be getting started right with the code and then we'll be doing a little bit of scene setup later all right, so we're going to be diving right into code. We're going to be starting with the cultist dissolver as we need to change a couple of things having to do with how we're spawning the particles and specifically how we're reparenting the particles once the rigid body is no longer necessary. I realized after messing around with it that the particles were actually resetting to 000 in the world space and as a result they were disappearing randomly and not always consistently. I'm not entirely sure why but for whatever reason they were and going ahead and creating a vector 3 for the position and rotation based off the particles current global position rotation right before we separate them from the ragdoll and then pasting those positions and rotations back in just resolves the issue. So we can go ahead and save that. We're going to leave that alone and we're going to change a couple things with the enemy AI control. So first off, we're going to need a fair few exports for handling the AI's attacking and what kind of timetables it attacks on. So we're going to go ahead and create a new category for our attack settings. We're going to need a reference to the limb placement controller, and we can just cache that as limb controller. Then we're also going to need a float variable for the minimum and maximum attack delay, as well as an attack initiation distance and an attack damage distance. Now, the initiate distance is just the distance with which the AI is allowed to jump at the player. I set this to a lower value value just because I found that if you set it to too high of a value you end up with AI behind walls and stuff a ways away from the player jumping against the wall that would probably be something we need to fix in the future but for now this will work just fine setting it down to six and then the damage distance is handled for damaging the player based off of how close they are during a jump now this isn't ideal I would prefer to have an actual collider but for the time being this is a lot faster to get implemented and get working now we also have an attack force here now the attack force is used to push the player away and push the AI in the opposite direction whenever it impacts and I found 30 just worked out pretty good. Now down at the bottom, I am going to need two more private variables. This is going to be attack cooldown, which is going to be a float and it's just going to be subtracted from as well as a boolean saying whether we are attacking or not. And now we can get into the functions. Now just below ready, we're going to go ahead and create a new function for resetting that attack cooldown. And all we're going to do is create a new random number generator, randomize it, and then give the attack cooldown a random number between the minimum and maximum delays. And then we're just going to set is attacking defaults to go ahead and reset that. And now we're going to actually create the function for attacking, which is going to be down below all of these functions. Let's go ahead and set it down right above the process function. Now it's going to be called attack target. It's going to receive a node 3D as a parameter, which is just going to be called parent node. And it's going to return a Boolean, which defines whether it found a damageable node within that parent. Remember, damageables are a node underneath whatever the parent is. And so it's going to search underneath whatever node you give it. In this case, it's going to be the player node and we're going to have a damageable right underneath the player node. So first off, let's go ahead and get that damageable if there is one. We'll just use the parent node dot get node and then put in quotations damageable as damageable object. And if it does not equal null, then we can go ahead and return true. And if it does equal null, we can go ahead and return false. Now within that if statement, we're first off going to go ahead and call the hit object function on the damageable object which if you recall requires a hit location, a force, as well as an aggressor body node. So we can go ahead and pass that in as our current global position of the navigation agent, not this node, but the navigation agent within this node, because remember this node doesn't move, whereas the rollerball does. And then for the force, we're gonna be passing in a vector pointed from the navigation agent towards the parent node's global position, normalized and multiplied by attack force. And then we're just gonna pass in self as the aggressor node. And actually, in hindsight, I should probably pass in the navigation agent as the aggressor node. Now, in addition to this, we do need the AI to actually bounce off of the player once it hits. So we're going to create a new vector, which is going to be called bounce vector. It's going to be taking a vector pointed towards the navigation agent from the parent agent multiplied by attack force. So just pretty much the opposite of that vector. And we're initially going to go ahead and set our pathing target to the global position plus that vector so that that way it actually starts pathing towards that location. And then we're also just going to go ahead and apply an imp so that that'll go ahead and bounce off the AI. And that's pretty much it for the attack function. Now we do need to handle the attack cooldown as well as actually calling the attack function. 
Now, first off, we can say if attack cooldown is greater than zero, let's go ahead and subtract delta from it and max it out at zero so that that way it never goes below zero. Then we can go ahead and handle if we are currently attacking. In which case, if we are currently attacking and our current target equals null, so the AI, the target that the AI is trying to attack was for some reason deleted or something, let's go ahead and just cancel out that attack. It's no longer necessary. However, if that's not the case, we can go ahead and handle the actual damage. So if our current target's global position's distance to the navigation agent's global position is less than or equal to the attack damage distance, we can go ahead and call those two functions we just created to reset the attack cooldown and go ahead and attack the target. And then after that, if attack cooldown equals zero, we go ahead and say attacking is false and continue. Otherwise, we return. So if we are currently attacking, but the attack cooldown has been subtracted down to zero, we go ahead and cancel out this attacking and do the rest of the code. But otherwise, we just return so that nothing else below this happens. That way the AI doesn't do anything weird when it's attacking. Now down here in the if target it does not equal null, then we're going to go ahead and create a new if statement. And we're going to say if the attack cooldown equals zero, so we're not currently in cooldown from the last attack, and if our navigation agent's distance to the current target's position is less than the attack initiate distance, and the limb controller is not requesting a launch, so we don't spam this attack multiple times and we also don't attack while in the air, we can go ahead and call the limb controller dot on attack launch requested, which I need to create in just a moment. And that's gonna go ahead and throw the AI towards the target. And we're gonna be passing in the current target, which is just of type node 3D. We're also gonna go ahead and set our new target from the navigation agent to the current target dot global position. And we're gonna go ahead and set is attacking equal to true and the attack cooldown, we're gonna to set to the distance between the current target and the navigation agent divided by the maximum velocity of the navigation agent multiplied by the launch velocity multiplier of the limb controller multiplied by two. And what this should get is a very rough estimation of the time it will take to get to the player to get to the target from its current location multiplied by two so it has plenty of time to get there. And that should work for the AI controller. Let's go ahead and handle the limb placement controller. Now the limb placement controller is gonna be real simple. We're just gonna change a couple things. We're gonna duplicate this on launch requested function and we're gonna rename it to on attack launch requested and we're gonna be passing in a target of type node 3D. And all this is going to do is replace the waypoints position. And we can go ahead and set that right there to the target.global position. And everything else will stay exactly as it currently stands. Now we've handled the attacking of the AI and it'll be damaging a damageable node on the player, but we now need to actually create a script that will handle the health of the player based off of the damageable. So let's go ahead and create a new folder in the codes folder. We'll just call that player and let's go ahead and create a new script inside of that folder. We'll call that player health controller. And let's go ahead and get started with a couple exports. First off, we're gonna to need a reference to the player body. Now I did actually have to set this as a class name up here in the player body, just so it's accessible, but nothing else about the player body controller change. Then we also need the damage effect material and I'll show you that in a moment. And we are going to need a heal delay and heal rate. Now the heal delay and heal rate, I'm kind of functioning on a system kind of like Modern Warfare, if you've ever played that, where you take damage and you can take a couple hits and it displays an overlay over the screen showing you how damaged you are. And then if you take too many hits, you die. But if you just wait a little while, you'll end up regenerating. This kind of solves all the problems of having to create items for med packs and things like that. Obviously, this isn't what I would do in an actual survival game, but for the time being for this little demo, it works just fine. Now, in addition to this, we also need a flash fade rate and a health total. Now the health total is going to be obviously handling the health, but the flash fade rate is going to be handling the speed at which it fades down from the flashes. So we're going to have an overlay that as we add value to one of its parameters, it will get more and more damage. So it'll go from nothing to a desaturated to a red to a black overlay and the flash is every time you take damage it's going to bump it up a little bit above what it currently is and then rapidly go back down to what it is so if you take the first hit it will flash red and then fade back to desaturated if you take a second hit it will flash black and then fade back to red in addition to this we're going to need about four private variables the first one's going to be the current health and that's pretty self-explanatory as well as the current health delay the current heal delay, the current overlay weight, and the current flash power. Now the current overlay weight will be between zero and three, the current flash power will be between zero and one, and the current heal delay will just be set to whatever the heal delay is and then subtract it over time until it decides to heal. So let's go ahead and update the ready function. We're gonna be setting the current health equal to the total health on ready. And now we need to create a function to handle the signal from the damageable for the on damage function. So we're just gonna call that on damage. We're gonna be taking a hit location, a force, and an aggressor body node. And first off, let's go ahead and subtract one from the current health. 
and we're going to clamp that between zero and the health total. And immediately after, we're just going to check to see if the current health equals zero. Let's go ahead and reset the shader parameter on the material and reload the current scene. Now, the shader parameter is a little bit complicated, so let's go ahead and go look at that and show you what it looks like. So the way we're doing this is via post-processing effect using the canvas item approach. There's two ways to do post-processing in Godot at the current state. One is with a canvas item and one is with a mesh instance in the world. We're doing the canvas item for this one because it was just the easiest. It takes a material and it's applied to a color rect, which is just set to the transform of full rect and put into a canvas layer. And that is given a material which has this custom shader on it. Now I won't go over all the custom shader, but rest assured, all it really does is take the screen texture and based off of this effect strength right here, it either desaturates the edges, turns them red or turns them black with a little bit of a pulsing effect and an overlay. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. I just added a color rect that's behind the damage overlay so that now you can kind of see what the effect will be. And if we set this up to one, you can see the edges are kind of desaturated. They're grayed out. And you can also see the veins right there in a pulsing effect. If we set this up to two, it'll become even more noticeable. And now it's red. It's using this gradient down here to change this. So we can set this to technically anything we wanted. We can set it to pink or yellow or what have you. But for the time being, I'm just gonna leave it red. Now, if we set this up to three, it'll go like black around the edges. And this is a very strong vignette. And you have all of these variables right here to control what it looks like. And you can also pass in your own overlay effect. I just made mine in Photoshop in a couple minutes. And we're gonna set that back to zero and delete the test color rect. And we're gonna be using this script, but we're gonna be just accessing the material. Now in the past, I did use shader instance variables, but for this occasion, we have to use a material because canvas items don't actually have shader instance variables. So we'll just have to work with this. So getting back into the code, we're setting that shader parameter right here, which is just called effect strength to a value of zero. And that just resets it before the next scene. As since we're not using shader instance variables, this will not reset between scenes. So you need to reset it manually. This is also not ideal in the future. I really want to have a menu for the player to access, and we're probably going to be doing that next week. Now, in addition to this, we can go ahead and set our heal delay to the max heal delay as well as our, as well as our current flash power equal to one. Remember, it only ever equals zero or one, and it's just going to subtract tracked from one back to zero immediately. And last but not least, we can use that reference to player body to impulse the camera using the force and the force length as the power and setting our velocity plus equal to force. This isn't an ideal way to pass over the velocity to the player body controller, but for the time being, this will work just fine. Now, before we get to the process function, I do want to go ahead and create a little helper function here. All it's going to do is take the current health divided by the current total. So that'll get a value between zero and one based off of how much health you have and remap it from zero to one to three to zero. So when when the player has zero health, that value will equal three. And when the player has max health, that value will equal zero. That's mapping it to that effect strength over here on the right. And then we're just going to be adding to it the current flash power. So we're going to be using this to reference in the process function, whatever our current overlay weight should be. Now in the process function, we can go ahead and handle the current health regen. So we can check to see if our current health is less than our health total. And if so, we're going to check to see if the current health delay is greater than zero. If so, we're just going to subtract delta from it. But if not, we're going to go ahead and set our current health plus equal health rate multiplied by delta. And if that goes over the health total, just flatten it out to the health total. This will just make sure that whenever our health is less than total and the delay is gone, then we go ahead and add to the health. But if there is a delay, we just subtract from. Now we can also subtract from our current flash power. So if our flash power is greater than zero, it'll just go ahead and subtract from it delta multiplied by the flash fade rate and clamp that between zero and one. And next up, we're going to go ahead and check to see what our current target overlay weight should be. Then we're going to check to see if the new target overlay weight equals the current overlay weight, in which case we don't need to do anything. We can just go ahead and return. If it's greater than the current overlay weight, we're just going to hard snap the current overlay weight to it so that that way, if it's going up, it goes up instantly. And if not, we're going to go ahead and subtract from it flash fade rate multiplied by delta. Now, if this overshoots, which it may very well, we need to go ahead and clamp it back to the new overlay weight. And whatever the case may be, we go ahead and set the shader parameter of effect strength to that new overlay weight. So this should make sure that anytime it needs to go up, it goes up instantly. And anytime it needs to go down, it fades back down. And that should be pretty much it. So we're good to go here We can go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and implement it. So let's create two new nodes in the player body and let's move them both above the canvas layer. The first one's going to be called damageable. And the second one is going to be called player health controller. 
Now to the damageable node, we can go ahead and add the damageable script and we don't have to add any sort of impact effect. You can if you like, but remember it's going to be up very close to the player body. So if you do add an impact effect, make sure that it's something that's not too noisy that prevents the player from actually seeing what's going on. Then we can add to the player health controller, the player health controller script, and we can go ahead and assign a few variables here. So first off, we're going to assign the player body to the player body node. We're going to also go ahead and assign the damage effect material to the damage overlay material in the materials slash player folder. And we can leave everything else as is. And if we go ahead and save, we can hop over to the cultist prefab and we do need to go ahead and assign the limb placement controller over here. Let's go ahead and go over to the damageable and make sure to tie in that signal. I forgot to do this on the C sharp one and it came back to bite me. So let's go ahead and save that. It's now tied onto the on damageable function. Let's go ahead and hit play and see how that looks. All right, now he's jumping towards me. Let's see if he attacks. Oh, and he overshot. All right, I may be adding something to the position that I shouldn't be. Let's go ahead and double check this real quick. Let's see if he attacks. Yeah, he's launching above the player. All right, let's figure that out. All right, so I figured out the issue right here on on attack launch requested. I thought that the only thing we needed to change was the initial target location, but we did need to actually change this. I forgot to implement this from the C sharp version. And we're going to be setting that to 0.1 instead of 2.0 as we no longer need to overshoot excessively. We need to go straight towards the target location. So we're going to be using that in order to make sure that the AI goes straight towards the player as opposed to just launching up in the air like it was. So let's go ahead and save that and test that out. All right. So he's crawling around. Let's see if he attacks. Oh, oh he did attack. <laughs> he's just bad at it. Come on, hit me. All right, so he's, you can see the edges are now desaturated, and when he attacks again, now they're all red. And if he attacks again, they should go all black. Oh, and I died. Yeah, so that's also why I don't want to restart the level immediately upon death. I want to actually pop up a proper screen so that that way we can see it in action and we don't end up with just stuck with the, uh, the lag there at the end. So let's go ahead and kill him. And if we wait just a second, we should see it fade away. So right now it's all red. And then after about 10 seconds, it fades back to desaturated and then fades back to normal completely. And that's going to be pretty much it. That works just fine. So next week, we're going to be doing some basic menus. And then the following week, we're going to be doing audio. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all had a wonderful week and I hope you all learned something. We'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.